the business of art. Brought to you by the video department. All right, welcome to the business of art. I am your host, Matt Polson. We are here with <laughs> my wonderful guest, Jamar Jones, and also making his podcast appearance, we have Bartlett O'Leary Polson Gilman. <laughs> Um, who is our dog. Jamar, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Excited to be here. Little does anyone know, this is only Jamar's second time meeting Bartlett, and he is clearly uh, Bartlett's favorite person ever. <laughs> I'm honored because... I mean, to be chosen by Bartlett. It's, yeah. What a gift. <laughs> because, if you were, uh, listeners who do not know, Bartlett is very picky about who he gives his attention to. And in fact had almost never cuddled with me and my wife until... Wait, is that true? When he saw you and cuddled with you that time when you first came here, he had maybe like sat in our lap once and we had had him for probably six, seven months. And, but he can't... Well, you know, I come with... I think I come with dog baggage. Maybe he's just like, I want to heal the wounds of prior dogs. <laughs> and he's like, he said, he said, I saw where that other dog hurt you, but I'm here to heal it. Honestly... <laughs> This boy's intuition is unbelievable when mm. me or Allison are sad. Like, the way that his demeanor changes towards us is very clear. Aww. He's a good boy. You're a good boy, bub. Now get out of here. <gasps> He's doing his thing. He's hit. Right, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I think that you and I were friends before, like, me and Allison were ever together. Yeah, we were, we had, like... Because of the Richmond scene, we were like always circling one That's another. Because right. we've never, no, never officially worked together. No. I feel like the first actual project was your wedding. <laughs> I mean, but what a what so what, a what role did you perform at the wedding? You know, no, I was I had the honor of of officiating. You all are my first and only, the most, uh, you know. Yeah. But oh, I was that that role stressed me out in like the best way because I just wanted to show up for y'all and just and remember we were working with some mother nature vibes going on and wind blowing and papers but i was just like breathe let us be present but y'all were beautiful and i think i mean it, it got done yeah it all went fine it all and went fine the you know they say the metaphor about the raining on your wedding day is it's it, the knot that is tied becomes stronger when it's wet that's what they say. Well, let me go. Let me try to go find somebody to marry me during hurricane season, Ed, because <laughs> <laughs> let me let the let the knot be unbroken. OK, well, I think, yeah, I think <laughs> hurricane season is actually a really popular time for weddings, I think. So, I know. Yeah. Also, though, I mean, I don't know, global warming and everything. It's it makes put me all in my feels. I don't yeah. know. Hurricanes. But anyway, I love a strong shout out to a strong knot. I didn't know that. Well, yeah. I was happy to just to be facilitating that. But I feel like that is when we. We we actually worked, but before that, it was always like you know. I was like, "Who's this guy? I see him in plays. Then he's directing plays, and he sings his face off, and then he does the acting and all." And so, but you know, here we are. Yeah, I like to think that we were coming from a place of not really knowing each other, but of mutual, mutual respect, respect for each other's work. Period. <clears throat> Absolutely. And it becomes so much easier to become friends with someone when you go into it being like, oh, this person's good. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I can at least like, you know, com uh, when, when I'm seeing their shows and talking to them after, it's very authentic, which <laughs> I'm we don't have to get into that. Versus the you, after a show, you go up, to, go up to someone and say, congratulations yeah the great bit from 30 rock where it's like a montage and it's like the costumes were so good oh my gosh i mean listen what we're talking about the business of acting after show conversations sometimes those are the hardest oh my yeah, goodness but yeah. yeah well get there it's just yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, t let's just start at the very beginning where'd you grow up yeah <sighs> Right here in sweet old Richmond, Virginia. I'm born and raised in 1991. <laughs> technically, technically, I really grew up in, Ch I guess, Chesterfield County. Okay. So, And I feel like they finally just changed it on the postal address to say North Chesterfield. But, like, right. Richmond was home um, and grew up here. Spent time in North Carolina because that's where my dad's family's from. Um, all Literally, the whole side. They're in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. So... Southern born and bred. Love it. Where yeah. did you go to high school? 
Meadowbrook High School, which is where I fell in love with the arts, mm-hmm. thanks to my very first drama teacher, Charmaine Crowell White, who I still love dearly. Shout out because she we love doing shout outs. If you're watching this, maybe I'll send the tape to Charmaine <laughs> because literally she said to me, I wanted to get involved with the theater since I was honestly uh, six and seven, but I. You know, our little emotional insecure baggage of like, I felt like the ugly duckling and glasses and chungby and blah, blah, blah. And I was just scared of mm-hmm. myself and my own shadow. <laughs> but but all that to be said, Meadowbrook was my introduction um, there. And I was also an IB kid. Shout out to any IB kids out there. Okay, I Mr. Brains. I, 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 theory of knowledge was my jam. <laughs> So, yeah, so you said you became interested when you were six or seven? Yeah, do you want that story? Yeah. Oh, God. Is it theater four? No, but okay. funny enough, uh, um, my classmate was uh, the daughter of one of the founders of theater four at the time. Oh. Yeah, and so we... Uh, uh, Hannah? Uh, Hannah, yeah, yeah. We were in elementary school together, and they did a, a class trip, and she was... Uh, we saw the play, and she was an umyak. It was a Christmas play. Hmm. Something, I think she was like, it was the land of misfit toys, which I still identify with the land of misfit toys <laughs> in my older years. But I did that, that, but it wasn't seeing theater necessarily that made me want to be a theater kid. I, I, I knew I wanted to be an actor and this might sound morbid, but it was strange. My, the awareness I have is when Princess Diana passed hmm. and it was early morning I think the news was reporting about her car accident and I was just really I felt a lot as a kid like even though you know I uh, gosh I don't know I have to do the math I don't know if I was five or six when she passed um but watching that for some reason I was getting ready to go to school and it was like a performance day and I just remember at that time I was like I really want to act i really want to tell stories specifically Mm -hmm. i just always had a knack for that and then i think theater became the medium that made the most sense for me to be introduced to storytelling and also find find my love for it yeah yeah Mm -hmm. and so you didn't have your first on stage experience until high school so technically i had two others but i count high school as my first one because uh i did play martin luther king and for this kindergarten speech thing and I wore coat, but it wasn't a full play. Yeah. And then in middle school, I went to it when I was in eighth grade in a private school, we did put on Roger and Hammerstein Cinderella and I was in the town's people situation. But some kids had made like some some disparaging comments about like because I was really like, I wanted to go for it. I wanted to be big and I want to sing or do something. And, you know, they said some unkind things and it made me kind of go back into my my shelter. And so literally that when we performed that play, we did it once. And I literally um, it was a uh, 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 what's this? The prince is giving a ball. Mm-hmm. Right. And I literally go, um, my daughter is looking crazy. Like I mumbled it and like because I just gave it nothing. Even though you knew what you were supposed to do. It was in you. And I knew I could do it. Mm -hmm. But that was me, you know, so concerned about stuff. And so high school, I count my very first play as The Diviners by Jim Leonard. Um, great play. Um uh I played um Melvin Wilder and Melvin came on stage in his overalls and said, You don't know nothing about drinking no hooch, dude. Yeah. <laughs> and but and it felt magical because I I mean, I felt like it was my real first otherworldly experience with um theater making and it just felt like oh, I don't know what this is. I don't know what I'm feeling, but I don't ever want to escape this feeling. And I and I haven't left the stage or performance work honestly since then and I guess I was uh 16 and my my drama teacher she I just signed up for the acting class and I was very shy and I was just like, I just want her to see me. I want her to notice me and know that there's something within me because I can't communicate it. I don't have this ability. And she she looked at me and I just simply said in class, I said, she made us go around in a circle and introduce ourselves. And I said, hi, I'm Jamar Jones. And she looked at me and then like three minutes later, she said, point at you what are you doing after school? I said, um, I don't know, just going home. You want to be in my play? And I said, oh, I, I don't think I can do that. She said, okay, I'll give you two days to think about it. 
think on it, but I'm going to need you at my rehearsal. Two days went along and she came back. She said, have you thought about it? And I said, I said, oh, I, I don't know if I'm prepared. If I could, she said, show up at 315. I showed up at 315 and baby, I've been showing up at 315 for all these years since. Okay. <laughs> that was when you were 16, you said? 16. And now I am a ripe 33. Maybe not ripe. That might allude to weird things, but I'm 33. <laughs> I'm just, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I think I'm fresh. Yeah, I'm I think ripe. you're. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. That's weird. Weird. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's weird. I'm fresh. 33. Yeah. You're fresh 33. I'm a fresh 33. Yeah. Just in a few months. <laughs> yeah. But we're 33. Hey. Mm-hmm. Um, amazing. Um, did, were there any other highlights from your time in high school? Oh, like favorite roles or anything? Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, it, it just, I'm so grateful for it because it just solidified um, my love. So I will say high school really taught me the beauty of ensemble work and just like, you know, really, and, and we called ourselves the family, which low key, I was, I talked to one of my best friends who was part of this group. I said, were we low key kind of elitist and, and isolating people? Slash cult, maybe. <laughs> slash, slash cult. Like, because we're like, we're the family and we're like selected. Like, we were the, the folks. And like, sometimes we had internal fighting that would be a mess. Mm-hmm. But, uh, but we loved each other and we did the plays. But, and so that, that, that familial, um, familial and community sense of theater making and just like, you had a group of kids. We all had a lot of different talents, but we loved the arts we fell in love with it and it really gave us a sanctuary so i love that um but yeah we had a lot of laughing mo- laughing moments one of my favorite uh two role two roles one uh playing deputy governor danforth in the crucible by author miller i felt like that was my breakout because i was like i'm gonna be serious i'm an actor and like Ooh, we was giving drama. Now, if I went back and looked at the tape, I was probably like, ooh, that technique is all over the place. But <laughs> but I felt alive and I felt like the power that you can have in acting and and what you can do. And, you know, also it was the first time like I always felt like I was looking for validation, especially at that time. And like, you know, throughout my adult years of I mean, as actors, we, we do it for the love. But also, you know, there is that part of us. We're like, do you think I'm good do you think i'm you know but um is danforth one of the ones in act two who's like one the, of the he the main judge. judge oh he's the main judge he's yeah, the main yeah, uh-huh yeah. and yeah he's reverend hale yeah. reverend hale but, you know role. yeah and i want to play it again but all like, the roles in that that's a phenomenal so, show that show should, should it, be done every five ten years every time i, I really it's so good I really, really, really want to do it again. Yeah. Like that is a- absolutely what I want. I directed to it at that. Maggie Walker. I'll show you some <gasps> pictures later because we. I, I just sent this to someone recently because I think Cadence is maybe doing it for their youth. What? Like their youth program. Oh. Um. Sorry. I hope that's not breaking news. Uh. Maybe that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> just erase it if it's not. No. But um. Yeah. Emma. Emma. Bilski, who mm. worked with us in Urine Town, which okay. you were supposed to be in, which I'm still, we'll get to that later. Um, <laughs> w- Emma Bilski designed the set for that when I was at Maggie Walker, and she won, like, won a bunch of awards for it. Oh my gosh. Um, it was so cool and beautiful. And I just, God, that show is just. The classics are the classics for a reason, man. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Like, it's, it's, and as high school kids, like, I think we, the the text, you know, because I, I mean, it is a lengthy play, just just in general. And then, but we we were so engaged. When I think about, it, and it's a large cast too, and it's a period piece, you know, uh, it, all those factors working. I'm really marvel at the fact that we, that show grasped so much of our attention, and like we. Re- each one of us really, really wanted to show up as our best selves with that and give it all we had, which I think is really powerful. And I think that that memory of that is is really magical to me. And um, well, a good script will do that to you. You know, it carries yeah. a certain weight to it, a responsibility just inherently, especially if you're a, a, a dedicated actor. Yeah. And I'm not saying that if there's a bad script that the actors aren't trying their best, mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. there's a energy and a momentum that happens with an audience. So if you're in a an Arthur Miller play, right? 
an hour and a half into it and you still got an hour to go, the audience is still with you. Right. And, and they, so you've got that energy. But sometimes if, you know, if you're in a new work and the, have, the kinks haven't been worked out, it might be 15, 20 minutes, minutes man. <laughs> it's and, like, get, get me out of here. Yeah, you th- yeah, you'll feel it as an actor. And so yeah. it's hard. Yeah. It's hard because you want to... You want to be in all. You, you want every play to be a Sondheim and a Miller, you know, mm-hmm. like and a Shepherd. Have you seen Barry Child yet? No, I haven't. Very good. Are you, you think you'll be able to? I don't think so, but very but, good. But you know, then again, I'm staying open. You never know what can happen around. Yeah, me. yeah but I, I bet, I bet. Yeah. Ugh, I need, I, I, I need to see some theater. Rich, it's been a. What's the last time I seen a play here? It's been a second. Jeez. Did your um, teacher come see you do stuff when you were doing stuff in Richmond? So she the. First thing that she was able to see, but she watched it uh, uh, digitally, mm-hmm. was when I did Fires in the Mirror mm-hmm. by Anna DeVere Smith. And that was, I think that was kind of like the last full show I did before I went to grad school. Um, and she and she was so sweet because she's a very much a straight shooter. And like, you know, like this is the same woman who told me, you know, like... I had to do this characterization of like a Southern Southern Belle uh, for a... a, a piece we were doing for competition theater what is it called vtas and things yeah, like that yeah, yeah. literally and she was in the audience she goes ha, 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 ha. and i said i went up to her afterwards the trap of an actor i said D- were you laughing did you think I- it was funny did it work for you she said no i, I thought it was weird so that's why i laughed <laughs> Because you were trying, and I just don't know what you were doing, and so I laughed. That's amazing. <laughs> so, but she, but with that said, fires in the mirror. She was really enamored because that that piece, for those who don't know, Anna Devere Smith interviewed these individuals based upon the Crown Heights riots that took place in Brooklyn, New York. She did this interview in 1992, and so I took on the persona of uh, 26 different individuals. So it's kind of like these strings of monologues and Katrina Carol Lewis directed me and um, my teacher watched and she was just like, even the way your feet were moving, it was specific. She said in your hands and and she, but so with that, it was nice for her to see that, Hey, you were, you were the foundation for me to give me the appreciation for this and the seriousness of it because she would always say she said she said don't she said you have to art she said we are the priestess of truth and beauty like she just gave us all the things and i I hold that and you know um she said and she would always encourage us to say i believe in the beauty of myself i believe in the power of myself and sometimes i fumble with that but you know what we're a work in progress okay okay she sounds like a terrific teacher she's everything that you would hope for and I, I I credit her with so much like I, I I'm grateful that I still have such a beautiful relationship with her and also just sometimes I'm like I, I'm most grateful that the fire still burns bright for the thing that I fell in love with mm-hmm. at 16 and even more so now it's I feel like it's stronger and more I just want to continue just to deepen with it so mm-hmm. I really um, yeah I have a lot of gratitude and I think the thing that's so cool is that wow people can really impact you like that like you know just in this life experience just like by her sharing what she knows by her being dedicated to what she does and sharing with us the importance of that and also giving her time to give us the platforms to experience that for ourselves and and do that it's like just by her doing that i'm like you've literally altered the trajectory of my life that's crazy. Like, I mean, we know that that's what happens. You see someone, you get inspired or, or you hear something else and that, that, that sends you down your path. But I think that's what I'm most um, enamored by and I, I'm, I'm touched by. And I, I, I think that's what I hope when we talk about stories, right? Good stories. I say, I want to be part of good stories because I hope what I can offer can um, something else. She always says, she says, it's important to leave people better than how you found them. Hmm. And um, and that's not being like, let me fix you up here, and let me. I mean, sometimes you might need a hey, extreme makeover, okay? <laughs> but um, you know, I hope to do that in the work that I get to be a part of. Mm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, what was your? Let's jump ahead. What was your decision making when you were trying to pick colleges? How did you decide? Ooh, I'm t- letting all my cats out the bag. So the truth was, 
so two things happened. I wanted, I knew I wanted to continue pursuing the arts. And so I applied and auditioned for a few conservatories, but for some, I was too scared to like make the full commitment. So I did have You some, mean in the audition? In the auditions, yes. Yeah. So meaning I got into three schools for the arts, like Virginia Tech for theater, Howard, VCU. And funny enough, I wanted to like audition for NYU, but I said, oh, they wouldn't take me seriously. And so I literally just submitted as just like a regular college of the arts and science. And so I said, I'll think about theater later with them, which was weird. So I didn't even audition for them. You um, were straight up in a river in Egypt, uh, AKA denial. Den- <laughs> Honestly, that was well placed. That was well placed. I think, I think I'm going to be sitting with that for the rest of the day, but I was, I was in denial. Um, yeah. Truly. And, but then I also said, Oh, I want to do something else. So how did I pick my college? I got into those places. <laughs> One of my auditions was so crazy because I forgot my monologue in the middle. It was an August Wilson monologue. It was for Howard. And literally, I was in the middle of the audition. I said, oh, oh, um, oh my gosh, I'm I'm sorry. Oh, gosh, this is so unprofessional. I never forget these lines. Um, please give me a moment. Uh, and I was in the studio with the red. Oh, my gosh, I'm forgetting my line again. They let me in because they probably like this child is a... Nuts. He needs us. He needs us. And I was all up. They were probably like, that was the most dramatic thing I ever seen. But they like they, <laughs> they thought it was part of the monologue. Like low key. Probably, I don't know that piece. I don't know because I literally just kept <laughs> freaking out and doing all this stuff. And they were probably like, oh gosh, help him. But I ended up going to William and Mary because two things. One three things. One, I got in. Which is hard. That's what people say. I didn't get in. Really? I'm pretty sure. No way. I'm pretty sure. Oh my gosh. I can't remember. Well, they're lost. <laughs> Look what you missed out on, William and Mary. Okay. This could have been your alum too. All right. <laughs> but get, got in. Two, people said it was a good school. I didn't do my research. I was just, I mean, I was just like, oh, it was just more so like, oh, you apply, like, IB Kids, you apply to UVA and, and William and Mary. Right. And UVA waitlisted me. Um, UVA waitlisted me too. Uh, we moved forward we, and we're still here to tell the story. <laughs> and and then, um, but I went to visit William and Mary and the grass was green. Yeah. And I literally said, well, they take care of their landscape, so I guess I'll come here. And I also knew that with the liberal arts setup, I could do theater, but I could also double major in something else. And so I went to William Mary and I double majored with sociology and theater. Mm-hmm. I didn't know it was going to be sociology at first. At first, I was on a track of theater and linguistics but honey i got into once i started working with ipa and different studies of language i said i said you are not anybody's speech pathologist maybe i can play one maybe i can play one but will i be one not in this go round not this lifetime not this time summer. will tell time will tell <laughs> time will tell that's that that's yeah so that's how i chose william and mary and it was great because I could be in the theater world, but I could, I, I had to do sound design, stagecraft, which I was terrible. Like, I appreciate uh, our crew members and people who are work on the production side of things so much because I was to rash, okay? Like, I think I got a C minus that because just because I literally was like, I don't want to do these additional hours. I don't want to build. I just can't. But also, I was dealing with other stuff in college, so that was his own thing. But, ooh. I was, but sound design, I was pretty kind of fire. I got a B plus in sound mm, design. So, mm. hey. <laughs> what were you like on a computer? You're Com- like computer uh, making like little pools. I had this sound. I think I had to do a soundscape for the Tempest, which, you know, I got pretty nifty for that semester, but it's really bad. I couldn't do anything. I don't know if I would. I barely know how to work iMovie. I mean, I mean, I, I put, know how to put like a little recording sound. Over, yeah. Like, do you for, do like uh, for, for self tapes? Oh, yes. Yeah. And. I mean, I will say some of them been working. I'm like, okay, we we done booked a few things. Yeah. I said, I made my self tape game, they, but they say it's like a muscle, you know. You get the rhythm, figure it out, and get it going. But I'm like, Ugh. did you study self tape or like do self taping classes in any of your studies? Not in undergrad, but in grad school. Yeah. Yes, grad school. This past um, fall semester, mm-hmm. year three, we were just churning out with Tia James. Mm-hmm. We we were churning out tapes in like. Tia would determine if like if the tape was worthy of being booked or not, and if it wasn't, you got to go redo it. And like mm-hmm. you know, so we worked on framing and 
and you know with the difference between your theater auditions and your television auditions and and um this past spring i had some really great um I guess work sessions and workshops, if you will, with, um, di you know, some casting directors in New York who work with different television or theater and just they really gave us some good how to's on how you want to land things, especially like if it's a television thing, like I'm learning to embrace the stillness more because back in my day, I'd be like, what, 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 you know, moving everywhere. But they want to see the picture. What can you do? What can your eyes deliver? Can we see your face? Just deliver move it along mm. um that's pr that's probably like a very <laughs> watered down quick quick and dirty but we need clips for instagram oh there it is you know <laughs> you're welcome uh, <laughs> but that is so helpful like i feel like grad school taught me just this the sim embrace your simplicity because for so long we want to talk about you know the art of it all I really felt I had to do something. And I think my time in grad school really taught me you're enough. Like, I think that's the one thing that, I don't know, maybe a lot of artists can identify just whatever you're, however you're working the thing. What you have already is great. So don't think you have to like pepper it and package it this way. Just if you start there, that can take you a lot of places. Especially when it comes to, I mean, with theater, for sure. But mm -hmm. when it comes to film and television, right. they just want you. I mean, that's truly it. And you're like, what does that mean? Yeah. But like, no, it's hard. legit, get out of the way so that you can just be there. Don't, like, peop I don't think people want to see something because they want to see what makes you uniquely you. And what I realize is if you don't book it, it, it's so beyond about you. Like it could you seriously the wrong be color eyeballs. Call, they want color, green eyes, right? Your hair, <laughs> sis. What you're a little bit too tall for their yeah. lead. Like you, like you, you don't fit in the pants. You don't fit the pants. <laughs> you don't. You cannot wear I, the pants. I have straight up lost roles because they needed people that were shorter or taller than me for sure. Absolutely. You, yeah, and it's like no, especially in film. Because the costumes already exist. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then they have to find someone to fit. Literally, they have to find someone to fit the costume. Right. That right. is how roles are chosen a lot of times. It's not about you. You're, you're still a wonderfully talented, <laughs> uniquely crafted individual. But not for this show. <laughs> <laughs> and and really embracing that, that's a, that is a healing thing. I mean, I, and I'm, I'm telling myself that since I'm, you know, very much moving into this... Um, gig life gig world all right well don't jump ahead on me because we got to get there okay oh listen we, we're gonna stay we right where we are we skipped over your time post william and mary oh in my gosh. richmond oh we got to go back yeah go back so we got to go back to that I, I, and so i'm trying to formulate a question because my little mic clip here dropped but i don't want to stop the pot mm -hmm. um so what happened like what was your first quote-unquote professional gig oh my gosh my first professional gig as, as as a soul actor, as so, a what? As a soul actor, soul act like a soul only soul s o l e. Is that is what that are you trying person? to say? What are you what are you, <laughs> just, what are you trying to say? Right now? Like like being like the this is your job that you literally are only supposed to act because I say that my first professional gig, I did intern at Colonial Williamsburg as a researcher and a part of that component I would go on stage and do like a scripted piece as and I was acting I was being an actor but Gosh. my first but, Colonial Williamsburg is a whole I, that could be its own podcast I do want to talk about it though that's on my time there yeah I, listen I have to be careful what I said what I no let me stop did, just did that did that start while you were in college no so it's uh the opportunity and the awareness someone someone uh, someone saw me perform who worked for Colonial Williamsburg and I was actually performing at my high school drama teacher's um, retirement party. Cute. Sorry. And um, yeah, I'll tell you off camera about my performance. <laughs> off pod. <laughs> we won't, won't release that story publicly. Uh, <laughs> but it was a really great, but I will say the performance, it garnered someone's attention who said, hey, have you ever heard of Colonial Williamsburg? I think you could be great here. And at this time I was wrapping up my i was getting ready to go into my junior year at william and mary and you were like um excuse me i go to william and mary have i heard of colonial williamsburg 
No, actually, I hadn't. I mean, I heard of. I had. I didn't realize what it was. That's why. So I had. Right. right. You I didn't. Did. Re- I mean. Yeah. Yeah. It's... Yeah. Because I didn't go to Colonial Williamsburg growing up in Virginia. I, we did Jamestown, Monticello, and the DC Zoo. Those were our trips. We didn't venture to Colonial Williamsburg, believe it or not. Um, so I really didn't understand what it was. So when they said, that, I said, "Oh, okay." He said, "You could be an actor." We. We, you know, tell stories of the enslaved individuals. And at that time, I was like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. I said, and, you know, I was like, as soon as I graduate, I'm going to go to New York. I'm going to, well, I didn't think New York. I was just like, I'm just going to go away from here because I'm just, get me out of Virginia. So what happened, this internship opened up and it was an immediate job for some money right after graduation. At CW. At CW, but it was only for 13 weeks. And I'd also gotten a theater for on tour contract rest in peace rest (laughs) no longer with us uh, uh, right did they still tour though no that's what that's what i mean (gasps) they don't tour at all no sorry i didn't mean to disrupt your train of thought but yeah no they just announced recently they're canceling the touring program oh my gosh that's been for years Oh, we'll have to talk more about that. Yeah. That, well, that's, that, that might be an off podcast. Off podcast vibe. Oh, my gosh. I, I'll pour one out for that because they, my first job was in the fall, the Jamestown story. Okay. And then in the spring, the rite of passage for many, I think, black male actors in Richmond, Martin Luther King in I Have a Dream. I have a dream that one day down. And I, I'm jumping. I am great. I hope the King Foundation does not come for me. <laughs> I think it's public domain at this it's point. Public, it's public domain. I still do want to do the mountaintop in a few years by Katori Ooh, Hall. Yeah, that's yeah. such a good show. Mm-hmm. I want to go. That's on the list. Yeah. Um, I am a mess. <laughs> <laughs> MP, I am. Oh this my is God. great. I this am is a, great. You, I, you've got some sound bites for real. Yeah, my no, this God. is great. Um, so, <laughs> okay. So, so, back to CW. CW. Okay. Yeah. It's, so, CW. Worked as this for the right after graduation. My job was to research, evaluate programs, do filing system of historical records, and then I also worked with Harvey Bakari. He had this um, p- uh, program called Princess Without a Palace, and it was something dealing with like um, Lord Dunmore's uh, Dunmore's War, and right the precursor to the American Revolution or the Revolutionary War. Um, actively beginning and so I would come out and I would read um, uh, some historical documents that were left from these individuals and so that was my I was acting so the thing that knock on wood the thing I'm grateful for I've always been able to supplement income as an actor since I graduated from William & Mary which I'm grateful for and um, so that was technically my first professional acting but also researching job which is a big component then and then that was in the summer of 2013. Then literally starting in late August, I began rehearsals for the Theater 4 tour, uh, which we took the Jamestown story all around Virginia. But also get into this. We spent a week in um, Wisconsin. And I was like, they care about Jamestown in Wisconsin? Okay. I said, <laughs> history knows no limits. Okay. They had cheese in Jamestown. Yeah. Well, also that play, we were also like, we talked about the can cannibalism in um jamestown and i was like we're doing this in front of kids and we said they were eating people oh, eating people that? oh i'm not probably might have ooh, it might have been one of the founders yeah of okay Edward, I think. That's, that's a great way to put it <laughs> mm-hmm. yep um, <laughs> yeah. So you you did your first gig at Colonial Williamsburg in 2013, summer 2013, and then yeah. you just to encapsulate so the audience kind of understands, you basically worked there until when? I only so the first thing uh-huh. I worked as an intern from May 2013 to August 2013, uh-huh. and it was over. Uh-huh. Then I went to see Colonial Williamsburg starting. Uh, 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 no, Theater Four. Um, from that tour, you see, August 2013 to April 2014, uh-huh. and then after that, I went to back to Colonial Williamsburg, but I was in the position as in full time actor interpreter, and I was there from April 2014 to July 31st, 2021. 
So for just a little over seven years. And then I left there and I went to grad school and I just graduated grad school uh, May of 2024. So. So, man, what is, mm, for those who don't know, a full time actor interpreter at Colonial Williamsburg? Uh, you wear many hats. Yeah. Truly. Like every that that's the one thing like your base position is you are part of the performing arts at Colonial Williamsburg, at least while I was there. I know there, there have been a lot of different changes and things, um, but you perform in the scripted programming that they have. So sometimes there are plays in the streets or straight uh, the so for those who don't know, Colonial Williamsburg is uh, I think the largest living history museum in the country and they focus on um matters dealing uh, the time period of um, the eight, uh, 18th century, specifically focusing on the Revolutionary War years. And so our job is to portray individuals who actually lived during that time through theatrical programming. And we have their multiple stages, multiple buildings where you're curating these programs. And also you are uh, delivering in character interpretations with um, guests throughout the day, or um, you know, even for me, sometimes you are f- you are operating in a host capacity because while I was there, I was an actor interpreter, but I also was a host of um, a digital series that would be streamed out panel discussions um, called like the Us series, past, present present um, and future and I was the moderator for that and so we talked about what is citizenship in America and the Juneteenth um, Juneteenth matters in business and so I wore a lot of different hats and um, you also wrote you know sometimes you had the opportunity to research um, you research historical documents and write plays and you perform that as well so I I wore a lot of different hats while there. That was that was my call for seven years. But you know, you are an actor, and you use theatrical uh, your theatrical toolkit to tell stories of the past. And so I was often not often, but I mean, take a look at me now. I'm I you know I portrayed enslaved individuals, um, and and I I also portrayed some free black um, people that lived during that time um, in Virginia. But it was. Uh, doing that work and the work with um, so many of my colleagues there has been one of the greatest gifts of my my life because that's I work with brilliant and talented people and I learned so much. That's really what got me a lot, open a lot of doors. For me. Y'all uh, for a while there, I know had a really special crew, yeah, really special crew, and like literally some of the most talented actors in Richmond were also performing at Kelowna mm-hmm. Williamsburg, mm-hmm. and. So if you don't know, if you're just listening, Jamar would be in full colonial garb performing these shows in 18th century uh, unair conditioned we buildings in, in July mm-hmm. and August. And I mean, it's it's mm. intense work, man. Like, yeah, it's that no first joke. summer wore me out. I would go home and just lay flat on the floor, face down knocked out what were you doing during like the slower times slower times like would be kind of traditionally i guess like our january february writing right writing researching rehearsing new works um revamping things yeah Yeah, that's what that's what we'll kind of pick up but it was never really january was the most like slow time to just really i guess you call it quote unquote downtime Mm -hmm. but we it, it would still pick up because we would start gearing up for black history month programming and things of that nature or there will be uh, each year brought with a different um um projects like i remember right before i left that january february i was the director of this um director of performance if you will for this uh uh digital 3d virtual tour situation and i was right helping write monologues and directing people and it, it's still out it's still online if you want to check it out it's called um uh, the legacy. Oh gosh, it's something. It's about to go to the Randolph House and 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 you'll see that and you'll see us pop up and talk to you. And so that was my my little baby, my little project. And I'm just proud of that. So we shoot. saw you do some really cool stuff. Yeah, yeah. And like I know there's a one thing that you had written. It was like a one person thing. Oh my gosh! One of the Pro- last things we saw you do. Yeah. Pro- was that me as Roger? What was? Yeah. yeah I think probably, so. pro- yeah. And. The- Oh my gosh! Yeah, we were these one-person shows. Like it, like 
it's crazy that it was a opportunity just to stretch your own artistry, mm-hmm. but also do it to really open people's eyes to something that they they probably never thought of. And I and I um, did some evening shows where I had opportunities to write some things with collaborate with musicians and my uh, wonderful colleague, talented man, Kurt Smith. Um, we did a lot of work together. He played, he portrays Thomas Jefferson and I portrayed his enslaved manservant, um, uh, Jupiter. And there was a lot to unearth there. So I, um, oh man, it's hitting me. Like that was a lot that happened there. Wow. Woo. Emotions. And you were doing stuff in Richmond. That at the was, same time, you were living in Richmond. Mm, I, at first, I wasn't before. Like, I didn't start living into Richmond, living in Richmond until I did Invalid, which I met Allison. Who? <laughs> oh, just the woman that you've been married to, and you know, I officiated the wedding. You know that that's I met Invalid mm. when I met Allison during during that process, and we did it at Firehouse. Um, we I moved up to Richmond then, oh, but okay. like when I did stuff like. Um, like top dog underdog yeah. and Aquila and the B I was still living in Williamsburg gotcha. and so I would just okay. I would get off work come up here to commute and then go back either I was way you're mad, commuting commuting all, always always but yeah and so Richmond I, I was always like oh I want to get in here and just start doing stuff and then it was great because you know I worked with like Jeremy and Katrina as yeah. a kid like the list goes Dr. on and on and Dr. T, Dr. T, Dr. T yeah. you know and so um, that Colonial Williamsburg uh, connection really opened the door for things and then you know we started getting it started moving I did mm-hmm. some Richmond was just I'm I hold very close the work that I've been able to do here it means a lot mm. yeah like just you know yeah and, and that was kind of like a um, not a renaissance because I think that we're due for a renaissance um, in the in the theater but I think that time was like a hot time you know, like yeah. pretty much from I was just talking to somebody about this recently, pretty much from like whenever Wicked came out mm. from when Wicked came out mm-hmm. to when Hamilton came out mm-hmm. is like a gold is like the second golden age of theater. Mm. And but Hamilton came out right around the time of the dark times. We try not to say the C word because sometimes Uh-oh. YouTube will like not. I think it's only if you're monetized, but I just try not to do it anyway. C O V I D. Oh, I was like, not me. I was just like, honestly, I said there was a lot mm, of dark there's times. A, there's a lot of C words. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, huh. Yeah. But yeah, mm-hmm. like during that time, like there was so much going on. I yeah. mean, certainly Broadway was like, that was a great time for Broadway. Mm-hmm. That was a great time for regional theater. And yeah. then the dark time came. And now, like, sort of Rich. all the regional theaters are. And we'll get there, though. I want to yeah. first talk about um, grad school. Oh yes, these three years. So <gasps> you're that's a kind of you going to grad school is mm. kind of a crazy story. You want to tell that story? Yes, I do. Like I always huh, give the shout out. Ooh, Bartlett's want to. Bartlett wants to know. I want to hear the story too. <laughs> <laughs> so does. I always like I'm trying to own all of my um, own all of it. I always wanted to go to grad school. I used to say. When I went to William and Mary, as soon as I got there, I said, "Oh, as soon as I leave William and Mary, I'm going to go get my MFA." And I think I specifically said, you know, one of the top two, top three schools. I said, "Yeah, uh, graduate programs. I'm going to go there and get my MFA in acting." Always said it. And by the time it was time for me to graduate, I don't think I needed it. Mm-hmm. Like, what and what I mean needed it. It's like I needed to work something else because I couldn't. I don't think I would have been able to appreciate it or really soak in everything that I should if I were to go right afterwards and I went and auditioned and nothing came of it like in in when I was uh 22 oh, right I, after undergrad. Uh, right after like during that la- in my senior year I went and got my face cracked so hard in Chicago I went audition for the top schools this any other people weren't even looking up from their papers paying any attention to me I didn't and at that time Erda which you would you would go and be seen by all the schools Erda they had like a screening progress a process and you would do your monologue for two people and then they would determine if you were worthy of being seen by everyone but guess what these two ladies did not think jay jones was worthy i didn't even make it past that screen they said he's not worthy he's he's not capable of graduate school was this an in-person 
Yes, it was. Oof. And just two people in a room? Yeah. Literally? I, like, oh, watch. Uh-huh. God, and they said, that's brutal. And so you paid all that money. I paid them money to go out to Chicago. And I could not be seen by the schools because they said you weren't. And so what happened? You Because I did not make it to be seen, they let me... They waited till all schools left and like whoever were the leftover people that would stay to watch you Monday after everyone left, you can go do an audition. And one place called me. It wasn't even a school. I would have gone there and got a, it would, would have been a conservatory that I would have gotten a certificate. And I said, that's disappointing. But it was, it was right on time because I needed to come here. I needed to go to Williamsburg and everything else. That's what I needed. And it was the best thing. So um, grad school. 2021 came and my spirit felt this. I, I, so many wonderful opportunities of creative expression, outlets were happening. Wonderful shows were on in line. I was working also as like, um, I was working as a sim specialist as well, like in doing, in doing like work study thing or projects where I was creating characters and like guiding people through DEI training and all this sorts of stuff. And so, so many cool things were happening, but my spirit felt, I said, I want to give something else a try. And like, I really, I said to God, I said, I please, I said, if you just open something for me, I will go. I said, I don't know what it is, but I'm grateful. I'm full. I love the life that I'm leading right now because it is the work of my heart, um, opportunities that give me joy and thrill. But I said, I want to try something different. And April comes, April 2021. I'm working on Fires in the Mirror at that time. My first time doing a fully produced uh, um, one-person show. Like, and then she, I think the show was two hours and some change. Ooh, I wonder. I probably could speed through it a little bit more nowadays with some. Yeah, no, I have some notes. I'll give them. Ah, I know them. you will. I know you will. <laughs> <laughs> Screaming. <laughs> oh, uh, break a ball. Break a ball. But, uh, <laughs> but I, I got this message from this guy who was in a part of the Richmond scene. We weren't necessarily friends, but mutual respect. We had seen each other work, and it was cool. It was always pleasant when we encountered one another. And his name is Adam Valentine. And Adam, he just sends me this text. Again, I don't talk to him usually. And he says, hey, I know it's been a while. I hope you're well. And he just simply asks via messenger, have you ever wanted to get your MFA? And I literally in the bed, I have a matinee later that day. And I look up and I said, oh, am I about to go to grad school? So Adam is at school. He's been accepted into the program UNC Chapel Hill, which is also tied with Playmakers Repertory Company. Adam's in this cohort. What has happened is an actor has dropped out of the program and they need to fill the spot. Adam, on his own, at his own accord, on volition, um, what have you, he reaches out to the heads of the program and he's like, I know some people. I think Adam, I think he told me he reached out to two or three of his friends or people he knew. And he said, I know some people who I think could be really good for this program. Can I pass the information on? And the uh, program head, Julia, I think it was Julia, said, okay, well, we're not going to open up the pool. They need to get this to us fast. We need to move on this. I said, yeah. Adam said, send me your stuff. I sent two monologues, some references, my resume. Yada, you already da, had da. some taped monologues? No, I taped. Okay. I taped again. I got something fresh. Mm-hmm. I need to get something going on that tape, right? Sent it to him. And no skin off my nose, right? Get a message from Julia, our head. We would love to meet with you. And I said, okay. So that next week, we had a one hour, hour and some change. I met with like... Julia, all my professors. You drove down there? No, oh, this is all on Zoom because this was so. This was it was all Zoom. Me them in my living room, and met with them. Viv as well, who's our artistic director, of playmakers. They had me doing exercises, work different monologues, this, that, and the other. Zoom auditioning is weird. Like, and this is when I say that the dark times brought some interesting gifts because, like, that access, that quick access, is crazy. Yeah. Open the door. Got off the call. Two days later, I get a message, and they said. We so enjoy meeting with you. We'll be transparent. We offered the spot to someone else. And I was like, that's fine. That's fine. But they said, we really wish we could bring in more people at this time. If something changes, we'll let you know. And I said again, it's fine. Two days after that, and I lied to you not, on the day, um, 
this is what happens. It was did not realize it. It was to the day my seven year working anniversary at Colonial Williamsburg. I was on my lunch break. I had just got off of a call accepting to do a summer project, a show here in Richmond. I literally said, great. Look forward to working with y'all this summer. Hang up the phone. Open my email at the top. It says, welcome to UNC. And they saying, we want you to be here in the fall. And I found, I realized that it was the seven to the day, seven years when I found out on April 29th, 2021. And then also, you know, I love my numbers, but num- but seven is a number of completion and perfection. And so it's just a little chilling that this thing that my, what I said at the top of the year, I just want to be open to whatever you have for me. And I said, it needs to be clear and make it plain that I need to go. Um, I just cry and I'm not much of a cry. I'm a Pisces. Con- contrary to popular belief, we all don't cry that much. Mm. Um, but I was just really full because I was actually mourning because I loved what I was doing. I loved the people I was doing, the thing I was doing. And that really, it really hurt my heart to have to leave. Yeah. Um, and, but I knew I had to go. Yeah. And so, so all that to say, um, all of those things worked in my favor that got me into grad school. And so like, you know, I laugh at him. <laughs> I, sometimes like I, I'll, I know he'll roll his eyes. I'll be like, I said, this is my guardian, Adam, a little bit. You know what I mean? Because it, it really going back to something I said, it really it is crazy what you can do to change someone's life. And you think nothing of it, you know, and like I get I'm touched by it. like not just with him, but just in general. Like he was not my friend. Like he, I'm like we didn't. He have still issues, isn't. But, he says ah, that is not true. I love that man. <laughs> no, but like you know, and it, it just he he owed me nothing. He owed me nothing. We weren't in close community like that, but just from how I've shown up in some of the work that I've done, he thought enough of me to put my name in that position, which is why in the business of all this stuff, it is important to speak people's names genuinely when they're not around. If you, if you think it makes sense, you know what I mean? Because it's not, you can't like, yeah, you can do this all by yourself and you can move forward, but why, why? Like I, I, one of my greatest pastimes is your joys is really just seeing people thrive in their gifts, in their power. And like, if there is anything I can do to help you continue to shine brighter, my God, let me know. Put it in a letter. <laughs> All right. Like, send it forth. I Man, will. You, you said Yeah. <laughs> I got the stamps. <laughs> Man, I got the stamps. It's here. Don't you worry. Forever stamps, okay? <laughs> That's right. Exactly. Got to love a forever stamp. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're coming up closer to the end of our time. Oh, my gosh. I know. I can't even believe it. I literally what thought that we had about? like 20 minutes left, but we've only got like five plus. Okay. Shit. <sighs> Do you, is there anything else you want to say about your college experience? Well, grad school was everything. I love that. That was really, grad school, I'll say this. Undergrad was like a wonderful introduction to me, like the real me. Like I, I was finally, like by the time I left undergrad, I could see Jamar be like, oh, that's who you are. Grad school taught me to embrace me mm. and to hold like me as I am. And I and I think the beautiful thing about grad school is like, yeah, I feel like I picked up a lot more tools on how I just approach my work. But also it's how I approach myself. Like you really had to it taught me how to really just sit with me and be comfortable. And I'm so grateful for it. And like I had the opportunity just to constantly meet people directors across the country actors across the country you know work intimately with a group of other artists who are trying to figure their stuff out and it's like this wonderful incubator of time where you can focus on the thing you love but also you're seeing how you come head to head with it all you know um and that is i'm so i feel so fortunate about that gift because i think I don't think I know because of my experience in grad school, it has unlocked a whole new world and opportunity of things that I'm, I'm able to get ready to walk into now. And, um, do you mean that like literally opportunities like in the people, or do you mean within yourself or both? Both, both, both. I, 
I know. Um, I, I think I think I'll have some things I can't fully say <laughs> say on the po- same podcast, but I will say there are um, some projects that are, I, I get to be a part of, and you know, one well, I'll say one thing. Um, this specific opportunity came because that person I worked with them while I was in grad school on a production, and I think that they observed me and how I worked in the room, and also saw my work and therefore they vouch for me with a community and a group of people that had no idea that has opened up <laughs> oh, Bartlett. And is that in a new, a brand new theater for you? Brand new theater, Bam. brand new, new marker. Mm-hmm. Yes. I mean, that's yeah. huge. You yeah. Know? We'll, we'll talk off. You got to get that one, that one opportunity. <laughs> that's mm-hmm. all it takes. You all, know? It t- all it takes. And, and, and new and, and so, so much new and, and, um, so opportunities also within me, um, I, 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 I give myself a lot more grace and also I give myself more permission to just really just be, just be and just listen. And I know that's, it's the most simple sounding thing, but when you really can understand it and give yourself the permission, um, I feel really grateful for it. And I feel like I had the opportunity to wrestle explore and understand that in grad school and you know and and it's it's come with uh quite a quite a few few gifts and i think some gifts that i'm still i still will be unwrapping for years to come whoa uh, mysterious ah yes i'm gonna shut the door because my dog is squeaking his toy uh, my wife should be home soon to entertain him oh yeah. um so let's talk about <clears throat> the business of theater a little bit yeah because you are in it let's see i've talked to nathaniel shaw who is a wonderful artistic Mm -hmm. director of a a smaller regional theater Mm -hmm. we've talked to lane satterfield who's basically the education director for a similar size theater Mm -hmm. company in richmond um but we've not talked. You're the. F- we have talked to Maggie Babalak, who is an actor in the Richmond community. But yeah. you're the first actor who we've talked to, who is really a. Let's just say, to make it clear to the audience, more of a national actor. At least, certainly now that you're out of grad school mm-hmm. and booking gigs in different parts of the country. So, how do you see? And I'm not just talking about Richmond nationally. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How do you see the, the, the state of the art, if you will, of theater? It feels up and down. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like there is, there's like the front facing of this is what we want to be. And then sometimes there's like, uh, do we have the ability to actually be what we want to be or also, and also, what do, what what do we want to be? So I feel like you're seeing some people staying committed to a lot of things that they said during the 2020 era, especially like when it comes to uh, era, I call it the year or post that time, yeah, you know, more, um, more than just a year. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like, are we really committed to to expanding the the certain stories that we are producing and that we are we are front facing are are we committed to to um opening up more voices being present and that's just that's not just like you know uh uh racially or things of that nature like you know from different cultures communities um focuses like how are we doing that and how do we get the butts in the seats. So I think that is something that the American theater is wrestling with. And also financially, I mean, unfortunately you're seeing a lot of companies that have very prestigious histories, um, cutting their staffs down, um, some shutting down even, you know, and we know this even from smaller theaters. Virginia smaller. Rep shutting down the touring department. Yeah, which is like, oh my gosh. And that, that we op- broke that news for you. Yeah, right yeah I didn't know that. I'm like, oh my gosh. And like, and, and that was such an opportunity for those, for me, like I'll say, oh, someone yeah. who's trying to act and, you know, I needed experience to help build me to under, you know what I mean? To work, to work the thing, yeah. to work the thing. And, um, so it's so sad that the opportunity like that doesn't exist for an actor who's fresh out of undergrad and know, you know like you know 20 anywhere from 20 to 100 jobs a year right. like depending on what's going on with their season yeah it's yeah. a real 
Yeah, and the butts in the seats thing. Mm. I think that's the the biggest thing. Is like what mm. what does that take in a post dark times world? Right, right. Because that has changed for some people. I think most people are generally back and like the reason they're not going to the theater is not because they're worried about what they were worried about during that time. Right. Right. Um, I think, you know, I think a lot of it has to do with just name recognition. Yep. Yep. You know, I I think the crucible would do much better than a lot of shows do in town. Absolutely. So it's crazy to me that people aren't doing shows like the crucible, but right. And, and it's like, how do you, how do you reimagine this model that has been around forever in this art form that we all know we love, but we have to approach it in a different way. And so I'm, I'll say like one thing while I was in uh, a company member at Playmakers, they, they did pretty well with making theater very accessible. I'll say like they, and granted every theater is different with like budgeting, but they, they had some pretty great filming to stream plays. And so that's how a lot of my family saw the work that I did. And like, it was really quality footage, you know, and they got that going. And I, I think that's something I don't necessarily know if they're going to continue with that. Now as we, were we they forward. doing every performance or were they doing a really high quality one time? Uh, what high, they would film and record the first matinee of the first, uh, the, the first, the first Sunday matinee performance of um, week one. And then they would edit it up, polish it, and they would package it. Be like, "This is your ticket. You can watch this performance." And so they had that. They had permission, obviously, from the playwrights and everything mm-hmm. to do that. And, yes, and some shows that's tricky. Yeah, some shows they didn't get it. Right. So like, there was one show I did. Like they would, they would have the um, archival footage, but they wouldn't be able to distribute that Which, out. I think I've had this conversation. I think I had this conversation with Nathaniel. Mm. That is the stupidest thing I have ever heard. You are a playwright. <laughs> a dying breed mm. and you have an opportunity for potentially like hundreds if not maybe thousands more people to, to see, see your, your work. work and mm. i'm sure it can be structured in such a way that for each one you're getting paid extra mm-hmm. like why can't that why can't that be the yeah. case if it's 20 bucks you get five of that like or whatever yeah. like why why are you what, against it and and i don't know and i, I mean i think it's are any, they afraid people are going to pirate it is it, that what it perhaps, is perhaps perhaps and i think it's different schools of thought because it's a I think we're in such an age now where work and so many things are accessible to us that when we talk about dying breed, like theater, you have to be in the moment to really, the idea is right. be there to experience it. I understand it. That. that. And so, but you're in the days to, of accessibility, right, you want to expand. Like, it. think about the basement back in the day. They worked mm-hmm. so hard for many years mm-hmm. to try and make that handicap accessible. They never could. Think of all of the people who would have been able to go see a show there. And like, come down. it's not about like, Oh, yes, theater is this thing that we experience. Mm. That's not what it's about. Yeah. You're not going to lose the people who are going to go anyway. Right. You're not. It's it's not a, a tr- it's not a swap. Yeah. You're not. You're trying to gain. Correct. You're not build. losing a mm-hmm. ticket sale yeah, by yeah, also yeah. offering a digital rental. Like, and, right. and, and people have to realize oh, that. Chaps. Ooh, oh, lube up. Uh, Just as we're he, winding down. Lubing up uh, as we're winding oh, down. Oh, my gosh. You know, hey, the, hey, so keep. Ashe. <laughs> so talk to me what two two last questions. Okay, okay. The one that I, I sort of Did prompted you? you, which is what advice do you have for aspiring people? Let's just start with that one. What what's the advice you have for aspiring actors or artists of any kind? Observe. Observe every space you're in, observe the people you are you have you are fortunate to work with. And I would say even in the moments where you think this is something, oh, I do not, this is not a good thing. Meaning, and what I mean is the sometimes there know that there's information to be had across the spectrum. I've had the opportunity to really just watch people work. That is, I feel like that's some of the best training grounds that I had. Like, you know, I, and I've, I've told them this to their face, you know, when I think of Katrina Carol Lewis or Jeremy Morris, who I got to work with at Colonial Williamsburg and in Richmond a lot. A I, lot. A lot. I, I, watching them in my early years, like as a, 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 you know, on stage here when they would do stuff in Richmond and, and not, that was incredible training for me up close you know what i mean to like see how they how they navigated the art form and that's and i watched them i studied them to try to implement things with me and like you know and they and how they would coach me and so i would say 
observe, observe, humbly observe, you know, don't think you know everything. I mean, I, 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 I certainly don't. It's there's something beautiful about being committed to being a lifelong student. There's I, yeah, I just graduated from grad school, but I am still learning. I'm learning the art of of, of self taping and I'm, I'm learning how to take my talents and begin to put them on television and film now and because I'm going out for more auditions for that and that's a new area for me of course theater is always my love but I'm trying to expand on what it is that I do and how I do it um I will there's an art to being an audience member yes yeah absolutely an art to watch because you because if we are meant to reflect humanity if we are meant to showcase someone else's experience you have to be porous in the way that you take it in to learn you got two ears and one mouth so you should be listening twice as much as you're speaking listen come on period there it is i'm dropping some real nuggets on this one yes yes listen i'm glad to be use it all accordingly okay all right use it accordingly um i will also say my advice lean into you lean into what you who, what makes you uniquely yeah. you because i i think i often approached my work early on and in middle on when even up to maybe yesterday <laughs> but trying trying to be something i'm not trying to create this different thing and that's great like we like trans we love a transformative moment okay the, the gag is oh, oh i don't know who it is anymore love that love that but Know that people are interested in really just you bringing yourself. And I know it sounds like so like me, me, like whoop de woo. But really, if you do that and like the more you embrace you, this is what this is really the crux of it. The sooner you can embrace you. For all the glimmer, the mess, the everything in between of yourself, the more freedom you will feel in your work. Yeah. And that that really is true. That's what this podcast is, because Mm. I have always, even when I was acting, I was thinking about the business of it. Like, Mm. that's that was more interesting to me. Like, almost there's a feeling of like, once you get the gig, it's like, okay, well, now I've already got it. Like, now now I got to get the next one because that's the business. Right. 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 And so and and so then you know when the dark times happened and Allison and I sort of started leaning more into our businesses and we started all these networking things I started yeah. to have like actual mentors and really started to mm. learn about business yeah. and so that's why this podcast came about it's like I love well it. dang like my brain is clearly firing on both sides mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. that is like I'm not unique in that way but not everyone has that ability right and right. so that's what I'm leaning into oh, I love that yeah like it, man, it's a beautiful thing. It's like you aren't leaving parts of yourself. You are in a, you are in an expansive state right now. Right. You know what I mean? Like yeah. how? Because it's still the thing. It is still the thing because the well, this creative whatever. That's the core. That's yes. the crux of it. Now it's just kind of like I just watch Inside Out too, and like <laughs> the second so, one. The second one. Oh, so good. But no spoilers. Um, but this idea of when you all these different things, components that you have, you just are finding ways to let it all be operating together i was recording a podcast for a client Mm -hmm. and the guest was a very successful entrepreneur Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. he said that he used to consider himself like a businessman and a serial entrepreneur and he had had a bunch of successful businesses Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and he said something to the effect of now i consider myself a creative Mm. and my canvas is business Mm. and so i create businesses and like that's Mm. what i do and ever since i've shifted that in my mind Mm -hmm. like ever Mm -hmm. he ever since he shifted that in his mind he's been more successful really very interesting i think the business that he was talking about is um i'm pretty sure it's rva water it's like he's trying to have 200 water stations throughout the city in the next two years oh wow yeah that's like clean powerful. drinking water. water. Yeah, yeah, that's beautiful. Because like there are some around the city, but they were probably installed in like the seventies, and yeah. they're nasty. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, the history of it all.